Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, another publication that I've actually done entitled Jean Baudrillard and Feminism, Sarah Ahmed and the Necessity to Forget Baudrillard. Baudrillard. So, but before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. Uh, I like to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, like, share, subscribe. You can see videos I release every week. There's like a backlog of 250 some videos that you can go and check out or episodes you can go and check out from a bunch of different fields if you're interested in that. Uh, if you want to help me out, do all those things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. If you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube if you're into that. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form if you're into that at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this essay, I wrote this about a year ago, and it's um, my effort to critique some of the problematic elements of Baudrillard's thought, and not just um, in a political way, but also to identify the ways in which his own theory seems to go against some of his own thought uh, when it comes to feminism and when it comes to trans people, for example, and how it's necessary to poke holes in his, his argument, to identify the ways that he undermines what he himself is saying. And that's my effort here. So without further ado, let's jump into this. And there'll be a link for this in the description. You, it's open access. You'll be able to uh, read it. It's for MAST uh, Journal, which uh, is the Journal of Media Art Study and Theory. Uh, and you, you can go and find it through the link if you're interested in that. So uh, Jean, Baudrillard, Jean, Jean Baudrillard's work has had a turbulent relationship with feminist thought. In Baudrillard's Challenge, a feminist reading, Victoria Grace attributes this turbulence to a general refusal on the part of feminist critics to engage, borrowing from Rex Butler, with Baudrillard in his own terms. For Grace, feminism is marred by either a political and philosophical appreciation of the politics of performativity, that is, in her word, words, the dominant logic of discourse in an era where the relation of language and world is structured in accordance with sign value, or they, feminists, are committed to biological determinism, a kind of, in her words, anatomy is destiny. In either case, Grace argues that feminism is only successful at replicating the patriarchal system it seeks to challenge, and that it would ultimately benefit from Baudrillard's radical theory that opposes all systems at their cores. At a time when we are inundated with mediated images and messages, Baudrillard's work seems more relevant than ever. However, it is important to temper this often cynical tone that is extracted from his work, positioning any ideas that flow from these media as prima facie suspicious, that is, as complicit with the oppressive logics of hyperreality, feminists, anti-race activists, and trans activists, to just name a few, have taken up these media to call attention to the forms of oppression that permeate their daily lives in the hyperreal spaces indicative of such social media. As such, our return to Baudrillard's work should be conducted cautiously, with an eye to the many anti-oppressive thinkers that have written since Baudrillard's time. It is in dialogue with these approaches that we can develop a Baudrillardian approach today to understand, uh, that is without replicating, the same mechanisms of oppression that these media and our entire hyperreal system propagate, in which they direct against the most marginalized. In this essay, I challenge Grace's faith in Baudrillard's work to wrest feminist thought from the clutches of hyperreality. Conversely, I argue that Grace's lionization of Baudrillard's theories as a panacea, or as a cure-all, to the problems facing contemporary society is itself a replication of the very model of hyperreality that she, along with Baudrillard, decries. This is because Baudrillard's theory of the simulacrum is not only a description of the effects of improved virtual technologies on the elusive concept of reality, it is also the moment where, in his words, everything operates in an integrated circuit a kind of death by recursion. When Baudrillard is proffered up as the apotheosis of radical theory, such as uh, such an integrated circuit, he, as he calls it, is concretized and the possibility for development is foreclosed. As such, I demonstrate the need to forget Baudrillard, borrowing from the title of the second half of Forget Foucault, that solidified Baudrillard's uh, excommunication from the French intellectual circles, at least as uh, I, I never knew how to pronounce Lautrenger properly, uh, Sylvain Lautrenger. Um, 
La Trinité? I'm not entirely sure. So to argue this, I perform two operations. First, I present Baudrillard's theory of the simulacrum, arguing that its emergence does not mark the dissipation of the real in favor of the virtual, or the performative, as it will become clear in this essay, but that instead it signals the emergence of a single worldview, or an integrated circuit, as he calls it, that is taken as objectively real. I employ this approach to argue that a feminist Baudrillardian reading of the many issues facing gender non-conforming people today have less to do with their merely adopting a hyper-real veneer or becoming a model of sign value, as Grace said, than it does with the emergence of the simulacrum that naturalizes cisgender identities and relations and positions non-conforming identities as being aberrations or deviations from a norm. Secondly, I turn my attention to Sarah Ahmed's feminist critique of Baudrillard's work in his own terms, as Grace puts it and how this critique informs the need to push Baudrillard's theories further than he himself pushed them. My focus on Ahmed is motivated by her prominence within both academic and non-academic feminist circles, attesting to the potency of her thought within feminist discourse today. Additionally, her direct engagement with Baudrillard's work welcomes a more thorough in interlocution between them. I conclude by suggesting that Baudrillard's theories can be and have been used by feminist thought, but the, they must not be accepted as inviolable, lest we participate in the very simulacrum that he so vehemently opposed. So this brings us to the first section, titled Victoria Grace's Baudrillardian Challenge to Feminist Thought, with the subsection titled Victoria Grace Reading Baudrillard. Victoria Grace falls victim to this trap of the simulacrum, suggesting that hyperreality is an era or mode of representation, in her words, imploding and displacing the real from its location of reference. By succumbing to this trap, she naturalizes so-called natural real, as she puts it, social formations, as opposed to hyper-real ones, constructing a binary in Baudrillard's work that he himself challenges, a binary between the natural and the artificial. He, he problematizes that all throughout his work. Her exposition into Baudrillard's work is incredibly nuanced, however, and demands its own investigation, further investigation. For Grace, the crux of Baudrillard's critical project is to diagnose the predicament presented by virtual technologies and the logics of operationality that emerged in the 20th century. These logics are underwritten by what Baudrillard calls the code, a rule that structures the relationship between objects and the relationship of objects to subjects on a scale creating differential points that identify the object. The code delineates the limits of acceptability for the seamless functioning of the system in terms of exchange, power, and identity. It prescribes a fundamental set of axioms that regulate the possibilities afforded to any person, serving as a simulated reference point from which no one may stray too far. Perhaps counterintuitively, there is a simultaneous explosion of signification, a move from equivalence to polyvalence, in tandem with the strengthening of the restrictive code. The code mandates and controls, but it also encourages and liberates. The code's two operations are guided by a common desire to evacuate any action of radical potential in favor of the continued functioning of the system itself. It is with this that she draws the distinction between what I already presented as the natural real, that so-called era or that believed era that preceded the code, and the hyperreal, which she associates with the code. The natural real is the model of social organization that gravitates around symbolic exchange. Now, for those familiar with Baudrillard's work, you'll know that symbolic exchange is something that precedes hyperreality, that precedes simulacrum, simulacrum, but at the same time, Baudrillard is cautious to create such a neat distinction. In any case, I'll continue here. So the natural real is the model of, symbol of social organization that gravitates around symbolic exchange one of ambivalence in her words and transformation through circulation. Whereas the hyperreal is the code governed phase predicted entirely upon operationality and perfectibility. The natural real, as she calls it, is thus an indeterminate symbolic formation, while hyperreality appears to embody indeterminacy in the free floating significations that inhabit it, but is nevertheless bound by a structural commitment to this nebulous thing called the code. In the symbolic, there is, in her words, neither essence nor absolute separation of subject from object, which is to say that there is a perpetual antagonism between the subject and the object without definitively cons constituting one or the other. They are in continuous flux, 
in a constant duel that abolishes the law of exchange. The dialectical play between subjects and objects never resolves itself in a synthesis as the Hegelian formulation would anticipate. Instead, it is sworn to extremes, sworn to radical antagonism in Baudrillard's words. And it is through this antagonism that they conjure away all reconciliatory identity markers. They are thus incompatible uh, with the code where, in Baudrillard's words, everything is arrested as a coded difference in a universal nexus of relations. Given this, it is all the more difficult to reconcile Grace's bifurcation of the natural real from the hyper real, real given that such a binary reconstitutes a system of equivalence, that is, how we've been framing the code thus far, that subordinates the hyper real to the transcendental terrain of the natural real, or I should say transcendent terrain of the natural real. Indeed, Baudrillard was wary of any clear split between the two, suggesting that even in the age of hyper reality, at the extreme horizon of technology, in his words, something else happens, another game with other rules. The point is that the constellation of the secret still resists, that is, it remains alive. In hyperreality, we see the maintenance of a dual, dual, that is D-U-E-L and D-U-A-L, configuration that revitalizes the antagonism endemic to the symbolic. It is not that the hyperreal inequivocally puts the symbolic illusion of the world to death, it is instead that there are forces that are trying to perform such operations, although they will, as for Baudrillard's optimism, never succeed. Science is one of the foremost forces of hyperreality because it is a legitimating principle of technical, technical operations on the real and on the world. He goes so far as to label it a terrorist rationalization that infiltrates itself into the genome and into the genetic code to transform the social body itself. For science to operate, it requires a real, objective reference within the processes of substance in order to justify it, lest it have no claim to truth at all. It is in this way that it depends upon a cultural appreciation of the objective over the superstitious, and of the material world over the metaphysical or spiritual world. When Grace aligns this natural real or the natural real against hyperreality, she is participating in this very appreciation, turning the problem into an arch-classical platonic distinction, one that Baudrillard decries in The Conspiracy of Art, that he denounces as a serious flaw. And to put it really simply, this is the idea that if you just leave the cave of images, you'll enter the real world. And there's a very clear, easy split between the two. Baudrillard is not so convinced. Grace's reading of Baudrillard's work is rigorous. She's one, one of the foremost experts, obviously. But there are moments that participate in the same hyperreal framework she and Baudrillard claim to challenge. Now I now, now I now, I now turn to her claim that feminism's failure to properly identify the structural edifice of patriarchal society is symptomatic of her understanding of the simulacrum as the antithesis to the real, the natural real. Now in Baudrillard's challenge of feminist reading, Grace critiques feminist thinkers who have dismissed Baudrillard's work because of his romanticization of the idea of femininity. Her polemic reaches deep into Baudrillard's work to demonstrate that his critique of in her words, anatomy is destiny, or in Baudrillard's words, uh, of anatomy is destiny, is a more radical feminist approach than those of the feminists who have argued that biological sex has provided a naturalized alibi for gender. Grace turns her critical eye to many different camps of feminist theory to systematically reveal the ways that their projects mirror the very structures they try to challenge. She suggests that Luc Irigueres uh, appreciation of the ontological specificity of women, for example, that must assume an essence. Uh, Grace argues that this just simply revital this idea revitalizes a markedly patriarchal configuration of the man-woman binary. And Judith Butler's extolment of the performative submits gender to a ver veritable sea of floating signifiers, as though it doesn't mean anything at all. Ultimately guided by the logics of hyperreality in the code. Taking aim at these broad camps of feminist thought, she argues that Baudrillard's theories are more feminist than these seminal feminist thinkers. Now to parse out her challenges to these camps, I attend to them one at a time, to be as clear as possible. So first, we're going to look at those camps of feminist thought that adhere to the idea of anatomy as destiny, as though there's like a, uh, by being born uh, biologically female, that therefore means certain things about you. So in seduction, Baudrillard argues that uh, irrigares, 
participates, uh, participates in the structure of patriarchal scientific determinism because she believes in sex as reality and in the possibility of speaking sex without mediation. In response, Baudrillard proposes supplanting anatomy with seduction, the superficial play of science that opposes the determinative logic of the code. In science, there are no definitive identities, only antagonism and transformation. Grace reiterates Baudrillard's criticism that Erigere's assumption of the biological anatomical nature of ontological difference strengthens the patriarchal commitment to biological determinism. Grace contends that Erigere, I'm, I'm committed to pronouncing it right, uh, restricts the possibilities afforded to both men and women by linking them to their biology. All gender is then only derivative from the transcendent marker of biology and is a means by which women's bodies are subordinated to men's bodies. Irigaray's project then steadily proceeds towards an impasse where she both wants to repudiate the restrictive pretensions of anatomy as destiny while also claiming in an original determining category of all things that no world is produced or reproduced without sexual difference. With this, Grace recognizes Irigaray's disavowal of the symbolic, the era in which there were no determining categories but only perpetual flux. Without this, according to Grace, Irigaré is condemned to only reproduce the same patriarchal determining system of anatomy that she criticizes. Now he returned to, instead of anatomy as destiny, to the performative as destiny. From Irigaré and the apparent feminist commitment to anatomy, Grace sets her sights against the post-structuralist approaches to sex and gender, indicative of the work of Judith Butler. Butler, Grace argues, differs from Irigaré in her refusal to acknowledge the political necessity of a project of sexual difference, and instead vies for a politics of the performative that recognizes gender as the product of, in her words, repetitive discursive acts that reiterate and indeed realize, in a sense of make real, gender difference. There is no truth of gender related to biological sex in the performative. The performative constitutes the site of biology as itself a product of the repetitive demonstrations of gender that retroactively designate it as a site from which gender is culturally and socially, socially believed to emerge. According to Grace, Butler's commitment to the performative belies her radical project because it only commits itself to the logic of presentation and signs endemic to hyperreality. The performative is, for Baudrillard, a consequence of the present belief that, in his words, nothing is true unless it is desecrated, objectified, stripped of its aura, or dragged on stage, a rendering more visible than visible, that is obscenity. This is not to leave identity to a radical indeterminism present in the symbolic, but instead to allow identity to flow freely, all the while being secretly tethered to the demands of self-representation under the aegis of a simulated emancipatory emancipatory pro politics of self-expression. Grace combines her criticism of these two approaches to question if trans identities are a, in her words, transgressive force that destabilizes and challenges the gender binary. So drawing upon the influential work of Sandy Stone, Susan Stryker, Judith or Jack Halberstam, to name just a few, who have made significant contributions to, the, to trans theory, each contributing, contributing specifically to the way that trans people are prefigured within the dominant matrix of, sex, uh, of cisgender and heteronormative social relations that permeate today, Grace employs Baudrillard's work to downplay these, in her words, transgenderist beliefs that, in her words, reflect uncritically precisely what is happening with the simulation of gender and accord almost perfectly with the contemporary hegemonic structuration. The violence of Grace's suggestion is striking for three reasons. Firstly, it positions trans identities as simply a means to transgress power, well, it, power relations when, for all trans people, their identity as trans pretends comes before any political affiliation. Trans people are not trans to make a political statement. Secondly, the disavowal of trans people's identities as only participating in the hegemonic configuration of gender as either anatomy as destiny or performance as destiny, ignores the fact that for trans people, their identities are a way by which they may continue to survive in the world. Uh, in other words, by framing their existence as a political failure to ostensibly challenge hyperreality, uh, extends the familiar oppressive discourse that shroud their daily lives. That is that they somehow have an obligation to be doing this 
political project that Grace outlines with the, just with their uh, existence, ignoring, of course, that there's nothing really all too naturally radical about it when it comes to just affirming one's, um, one's gender identity. And thirdly, it is incredibly ironic to, for her to uh, employ Baudrillard, a, a cis dude, as the authority on what constitutes appropriate or properly political identities. Now, beyond the immediate violence of Grace's treatment of trans folks, this approach betrays the over, overall Baudrillardian trajectory of her text. She inscribes the primacy of the performative under the moniker of the symbolic, that is the idea that all things are just indeterminate, identity is indeterminate, always in flux, antagonism, yada, yada, yada. Uh, she inscribes the primacy of the performative under the moniker of the symbolic that she had challenged in Butler by framing identity as a site of resistance against hegemonic power relations. Moreover, by, loca by locating these hyperreal signs in trans identities, she reestablishes the non Baudrillardian framing of a clear distinction between the natural real and the hyper real. In her words, the game of trans is one of a superficial play of appearances, and so it is articulated as the hyper real, quote unquote, other, in relation to the naturally real cisgender identities against which they are compared. This is not entirely due to a misrepresentation of Baudrillard's work, however. In The Transparency of Evil, one of his pretty seminal texts, he suggests that a transsexual or a transvestite are the only people left who live through the signs of an overdrawn, rapacious sexuality. They are the consequence, he continues, on lack of differentiation between sexual poles. Like Grace, Baudrillard's insistence on a real sexuality, specified to these sexual poles, belies his lionization of the symbolic as a site to trouble all determinacy. Baudrillard and Grace's conservative agenda overshadows the radical project thus far espoused by Grace, ultimately reinscribing the very structuration of hyperreality against the transcendentally real reality. James Sayers, or it could be Sares, in a publication in Transgender Studies Quarterly, puts the problem succinctly when they write that Baudrillard's reduction of transsexuality to the symbolic realm presumes appearance as domineering the essence of the subject such that the subject is hollowed of authentic content. Yet Baudrillard produces the very meaninglessness he critiques by hypostatizing the concept of the subject as form of rupture without reflexive critique of its historical and social construction. Agreed, Baudrillard's work mirrors the very concept of hyperreality in the simulacrum that he tries so desperately to challenge. Does this mean that Baudrillard's work can be of no use to feminist or trans theory? Not necessarily. It just demands a different view of his overall project that than the one that Grace provides. Now, I've argued elsewhere that Baudrillard's work can be read in conjunction with Butler's theory of performativity to address present forms of scientific discrimination leveled against trans folks. To do this demands a departure from the view that the simulacrum is only the moment in which appearance overshadows reality, as Grace seems to suggest. Instead, as I've alluded to thus far, the simulacrum must not be mistaken for an as an antithesis to reality. As a correlative correlative to Grace's application of Baudrillard's thought, heed the words of Mark Oliver de Pasco in his plea for the return of Baudrillard's thought today. His words, the exponential decay in the concurrent metastatic transmutation of the objective, the real and the rational into simulacra is arguably one of the most thought-provoking facts of contemporary history. Like Grace, Pasco situates the simulacrum as a succeeding organizational framework to reality. They both mistakenly identify the simulacrum, or the hyper-real, as antithetical to reality, when reality and the simulacrum are actually one and the same phenomenon. As Baudrillard argues, it is not then the real which is the opposite of simulation, the real is really only a particular case of that simulation. By contrast, Baudrillard contends that the real conflict is between integral reality and illusion. Integral reality operates, in his words, in an integrated circuit, as mentioned earlier, in the information media, and in our heads too. The image feedback dominates the insistent presence of the, of the monitors, this convolution of things that operate in a loop that connect back around to themselves. This feedback loop forms a totalizing Mobius strip, a perfectly tautological system that is hermetically sealed. The possibility for objectivity is intensified in this paradigm where the conditions for any given phenomenon can be traced back to a genesis point that has a direct relationship to that phenomenon.
There is therefore no necessity for the system to be recognized from without, that is a Hegelian other, for example, to confirm the existence of the system itself. The emergence of this objectivity finds its genesis in modernity where technological, scientific, and economic reality relentlessly proceeds on its course to the ex exclusion of any imaginary order. Integral reality is simply a phase of the project of modernity, the moment where reality becomes more real than real, more objective than objective, more simulacral than the simulacrum. The problem that Baudrillard writes against is thus not the threat that objective, objectivity may vanish, as Pasco uh, and, and Grace frame it, it is that there will be a profusion of objectivity that will foreclose the possibility for change and that will mark the moment where the possible itself is no longer possible. In terms of the trans identities that Grace criticizes as complicit within a system of hyperreality, an alternative Baudrillardian reading might, uh, would take aim at the reactionary radical feminist disavowal of trans bodies as failing to conform to a so-called or believed to be real gender binary um, or to biological certain um, associations between gender and biology. Grace is then complicit in the scientific naturalization of gender when she asks, in her words, if transgenderism is symptomatic of the simulation of gender-sex difference, as though cisgender identities, uh, I'm asking, as though cisgender identities are somehow more real than trans identities. As Susan Stryker has observed, science seeks to contain and colonize the radical threat posed by a particular transgender strategy of resistance to the coerciveness of gender physical alteration, that is, physical alteration of the genitals. Similarly, Cheryl Chase, in commenting on the surgical interventions often imposed on, just in this case, intersex bodies, argues that cutting intersex genitals becomes yet another hidden mechanism for imposing normalcy upon unruly flesh, a means of containing the potential anarchy of desires and identifications within oppressive heteronormative structures. The scientific intervention against non-normative bodies reflects a general societal repulsion of those people and bodies that do not comply with the naturalized belief, beliefs of sex and gender and their association. It is an example of a force that makes the possible itself no longer possible. As Baudrillard solemnly proclaimed it, those are his words, it is strange then that Baudrillard and Grace, that follows him, tacitly speak the language of the same scientific objectivity that they admonish, this belief that biology is destiny, which is the strangest thing about this. Grace spends all this time, so does Baudrillard, critiquing this idea of anatomy as destiny, yet at the same time they're like, women are biologically determined and men are biologically determined and they have to just embrace that. It's just a huge contradiction that I, it's just so difficult to reconcile. Anyways, tangent. So if we're going to use Baudrillard's work, there's a necessity to push it further than he himself did. That is not to just submit to this naturalization of sex and gender. And we can do this uh, by wresting its radical potential from the conservative and reactionary undertones that sub subtend and limit it. Now here I turn to Sarah Ahmed's feminist challenge to Baudrillard. For Sarah Ahmed, Baudrillard's gravitation towards an ultimately conservative theoretical framework is maintained by his commitment to the subject, the idea of the subject. Writing during the post delusio Guttarian effective turn, at least how they contributed to that discussion, Ahmed's feminist commitment is to both the interrogation of the European model of subjectivity and the post-structuralist critiques of that subjectivity. She contends that in Baudrillard's work, the subject is determined by indeterminacy rather than anatomy, class, or gender. As such, Baudrillard's postmodernism can, can be read as a normative and positive reading of the subject rather than as a rejection of its limits, as Ahmed writes. Rather than oppose the subject, a decidedly Eurocentric concept, concept, Baudrillard reposits the subject as always already indeterminate, as though the forces of power and knowledge play no significant part in constituting this free-floating subjectivity. By contrast, Ahmed, among other feminists writing against the same traditions, is not trying to reconstitute a steady subject that portends all social and cultural influences. Instead, she recognizes the various forces that delimit this new subjectivity and carefully limit its scope and potential. They form, in her words, part of a generalized discursive economy that stabilizes meanings, 
in the form of the delimitation of subject positions. The determining ground of subjectivity subtends the indeterminacy that Baudrillard lauds as a sign of some symbolic residue in the age of hyperreality. Baudrillard's subject is then doomed to mirror rather than challenge the system at hand. Ahmed's suspicion of the efficacy of Baudrillard's challenge intensifies when she considers the points of contact between Baudrillard's subject and capital in the 20th century onward. In her words, Baudrillard's postmodern visions of signs as proliferating and neutralizing connects with the very same nature of money as a signifier which can only quantify and as such idealizes the very symbolic power of capital itself to displace the possibilities of value and utility. By way of example, Ahmed considers how women's bodies are sexualized in advertising and how this sexualization grounds these bodies within the discursive matrix of bodies as commodities. There is thus not only a proliferation of the overt sexualization of women's bodies in visual media, but also a very structured attempt to ground bodies and to give them a kind of transcendent biological meaning for the sake of capitalist accumulation. So to grapple with these mechanisms demands an investigation of not only the broad hyperreal shift that Baudrillard writes of, but the structures of power and knowledge that constitute certain bodies as confinable while allotting some semblance of freedom to others. In theorizing subaltern voices, Gayatri Spivak's work on the status of European intellectualism contributes pretty well to this conversation. In Can the Subaltern Speak, Spivak takes aim at uh, Deleuze and Foucault, whose consideration of the subject is curiously sewn together into a transparency by degenerations and belongs to the exploiter side of the international division of labor, in her words. Spivak does not mention Baudrillard's work, at least in that text, but he could easily be transposed onto this critique. In identifying the transgressive potential found in the play of indeterminate signs, he reifies the dominant structure that subjugates some subjects, giving them a face, while liberating others. Ahmed develops a critical idiom to identify the operations that make such privileged indeterminacy possible in her uh, text, Queer Phenomenology, when she articulates that cisgender white, white men possess, in her words, the ability to move through the world without losing one's way, and, enjoy, and they can enjoy the privilege of transparency, that is, they don't need identity. So when Baudrillard highlights the importance of symbolic indeterminacy, against hyperreal indeterminacy, he fails to recognize the way that some people benefit greatly from hyperreal indeterminacy, while others are exploited by it. What is more, just because symbolic exchange precedes the hyperreal does not mean that it precedes the forms of oppression imminent to hyperreality. Marcel Mauss illustrates this in his seminal investigation of how some tribal communities across the globe have historically traded women like they were objects, in his words, as soon as two clans existed in a society, they necessarily contracted an exchange between one another, not only their women, the form of exogamy, and the rituals, but also their goods, at least at certain times of the year and on certain special occasions. In that, whim, in that moment, women are constituted and frozen as objects to be exchanged. Thus, we see a fundamental connection between the symbolic and the hyperreal in this, in this comparison in the societal use of women as a means of accruing power be it in the form of hierarchical status or wealth. The symbolic then appears like an illusory foray into a more equi equitable cultural paradigm. In fact, though, I would hazard that its reification presents an even more dire alternative precisely because of its promise to end all determinations, a seductive promise given the incessant coding and overcoding that permeates daily life by big data miners and global digital capitalism. Baudrillard's work can be used by feminism insofar as it challenges the restrictive notion of anatomy as destiny, and that is it is skeptical of the play of science to mount an effective challenge to the present proliferation of science under the auspices of the accumulation of capital. His challenge, far from a panacea, as Grace describes it, is only useful as a preliminary endeavor, in my opinion. When Ahmed moves from his thought, when Ahmed moves from his thought to consider the ways that power writes and determines subjects. She is assuming that the subject is non-determined in the first instance, that they are somewhat of a blank slate upon which power and knowledge can inscribe themselves. Seeing as Baudrillard's work, uh, Baudrillard's work accentuates this moment, the moment of undecidability prior to the types of coding indicative of these systems, a coding that reaches its peak in hyperreality. He provides a template for the immediate refusal of anatomy in the play of signs as destiny.
What is more, this assumption tacitly troubles the implicit assumptions maintained in some scientific circles pertaining to sexual or even racial determinism. Although this project might mirror the same determinative qualities of hyperreality, especially in terms of the place of women in symbolic exchange, for example, it can be used as a theoretical supplement to the monolithic forces of capitalist, sci capitalist and scientific patriarchy exerting themselves in floating signification and biological determinism, respectively. The potency of Ahmed's for feminist critique is that she, as Grace states, takes Baudrillard in his own terms. And these terms present the various contradictions in his work that undermine the efficacy of his radical project. Ultimately, Ahmed finds little use for Baudrillard's work, preferring instead a purely feminist approach that conducts an analysis of how power relations are stabilized and specified in specific historical moments in the empirical form of male dominance, for example. However, Ahmed's feminist critique uh, represents a surprising commitment to a key component of Baudrillard's thought, that is, the refusal to allot primacy to a single voice to explain and remedy the current issues facing society today. This is undoubtedly a stronger commitment to the form of Baudrillard's theories than their content. It's more a commitment to the form than the content, but it speaks to a cons consistent current that runs through Baudrillard's work the challenge against all totally integrated systems. And this demands a death of Baudrillard's thought as per his own prescription. As he writes, when we lose the possibility of death of the end, the playing with the end, then we are very dead. And the whole system has managed to deprive us of this possibility. So for an approach to be properly Baudrillardian, you must be prepared to leave Baudrillard or to forget Baudrillard. And Ahmed's feminist critique does just that. And that's about it. It was just my effort to wrestle with and to present some of the issues I find in Baudrillard's work, you know, on the one hand, this uh, admonishment of naturalization and a kind of critique of the rendering completely um, identifiable, rendering completely coded and understood by simulacrum, by hyperreality, while at the same time he's like, men are men and women are women and they have to embrace these this distinction that will allow this... Um, will allow growth to occur, kind of perpetual uh, thesis antithesis that will always kind of be in a staticky um, kind of confluence and fold into one another and bounce off of one another. And while there's something radical about that, at the same time, it does maintain and really stick to certain ideas that are grounded in the very thing he criticizes, that is, biological determinism, science, everything like that. So I think it's important to really read him against himself and to be able to find these moments and arrive at these contradictions and then be able to make educated choices for ourselves, how we actually think we'll move beyond it if we can uh, and how we can engage with it. So yeah, if you like what I did, uh, you know, you can leave a like or if you're listening to this in podcast form, you can leave five stars if you can do that. If there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Anything I was unfair about, I'd love to hear about it. Or, or that I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Take care.